What accent is that? I'm, I'm looking at the wrong camera. I, I think, actually, I think I'm looking at the Christmas lights, so. Um. Hi, and welcome to the Babbel channel. I'm Jennifer, an instructional designer and linguist here at Babbel's headquarters in Berlin, Germany. Today, we're going to be talking about language change, particularly how Hollywood changed the way Americans speak, twice. Have you ever seen an old black and white film from the golden age of Hollywood? from the late 1930s or 1940s? Did you ever notice how the actors had a very particular accent, maybe one that you couldn't place? Well, this was a very deliberate and conscious attempt among stage and screen actors to cultivate an accent that wasn't actually spoken as a native accent or a native dialect by any Americans. And this transatlantic accent was something that we saw primarily on stage with actors, and also among people who consider themselves to be upper class. And what was very characteristic about this type of accent was that R's were dropped at the end of words and vowels were elongated. So for instance, we didn't drive a car, we drove a car. We didn't dance, we danced. So we see these types of characteristic elements in early Hollywood. And what's interesting about this type of accent was that it was part American and also part what Americans would refer to as standard British or what British people would probably refer to as received pronunciation. And when people went to the theaters in the 1930s and 1940s and they heard people with this accent, they began to emulate it. And this type of accent started to spread across the country and it was considered very prestigious. Now, if you ever had an opportunity to listen to some uh, politicians from the 1950s or 1960s, say, for instance, the Kennedys um, or the Roosevelts, you would actually hear them using this aristocratic accent. Um, but it was something that we didn't really see anywhere else in the United States. Let's have a listen to First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt speaking at the United Nations. Desire to live in peace and friendship with all our neighbors in the world community. As we separate, it is right that we should be gravely concerned with the gaps that still separate us from each other. This is a really good example of what the transatlantic accent sounded like. At the end of some of her words, she dropped the R. So this was a non-rhotic accent. And you'll also notice that her vowels sound very different from the vowels of most American accents today. So is this Hollywood effect unique? Well, yes and no, because actually the Hollywood story isn't totally over. See this no R at the end of words and long vowel accent was something that we saw across the United States. But following World War II and with the advent of television, Hollywood studios had a hard time finding enough actors that had this accent and they couldn't train them fast enough to produce the amount of content that they had to be able to produce on a much bigger scale for an American public that was going to the movies more often and now actually expecting content to come right into their homes through television. So they began to import actors and actresses from the Midwest. Now this was a little bit different because the Midwest accent does pronounce R's at the end of words, and they don't have elongated vowels. And they sounded different from these traditionally trained actors and actresses. And what we saw in the United States following this wave of new acting talent from the Midwest is that people began to view the R's at the end of words and the shorter vowels as the more glamorous or prestigious variety or accent of English, and they began to emulate that. And so because of Hollywood, we saw a really big shift in the way people pronounced their vowels and the way they pronounced some consonants. But is this type of sound change something that happens in other languages? And does it always happen as quickly as it happened throughout the 1900s in the United States? Well, first of all, sound change does happen regularly in pretty much all languages. And generally speaking, the sound change is very systematic. So it's not arbitrary. We don't see very many examples of sound changes that only occur in a word or a particular environment. We tend to see that happening across many environments. Another example of this is the great vowel shift. And the great vowel shift was actually a very cyclical change in the way vowels were pronounced in English. 
And so some long vowels moved up and some very high vowels actually moved down and became diphthongs. In other words, a vowel that actually sounds like two vowels put together. The great vowel shift is actually one of the reasons why it's really difficult for high school students to understand some of Shakespeare's jokes, because the puns are lost on us because the sounds are actually pronounced differently today than they were when Shakespeare wrote his famous plays and sonnets. So for instance, we see um, the celestial body in the sky, that one that comes out at night and sometimes is full and sometimes it's a sliver or a crescent, that used to be pronounced moan. Today, moon. So O changed to U, it rays. And that number that comes after four, that used to be pronounced thief instead of five. There's a really interesting sound change happening in the United States. It's a merger of two vowel sounds. And depending on where you're from, you might call this the cot-cot merger or the cot-cot merger. What's happening here is that two O sounds are actually becoming indistinguishable from each other in certain areas of the United States. So for people in the Midwest, out to the West Coast, for instance, so almost really about 70% of the United States right now, a cot sounds exactly like the verb caught. Whereas people on the East Coast, um, maybe not so much in New England, but along the Eastern Seaboard, they definitely can hear the difference between caught and caught. Now, for people who are caught in the caught-caught merger, they don't even realize that these two sounds are merging in the way they speak. It's unconscious. But sometimes sound change could be conscious. There was a really interesting study done by William LeBov in New York City. He noticed that over time, New York City was shifting in the type of pronunciation that was associated with high prestige or high status. See, New York City was typically or historically an area where the highest status and highest prestige pronunciation pattern was non-rhotic, which means that essentially R's were dropped. But he noticed over time that more and more people of higher status or higher prestige in the city were pronouncing their R's, and he wasn't quite sure why. He went to three different department stores. One was an upper middle class department store, one was a middle middle class department store, and one was a lower middle class department store. Since he couldn't just ask someone what sound he wanted them to produce, he can't just say, hey, do you pronounce your R's or don't you? He had to get them to produce it naturally. So what he did was he asked a salesperson at each of these department stores, or actually he asked many salespeople at these department stores, for a particular item that was located, of course, on the fourth floor. What he found, unsurprisingly, was that the upper middle class department store pronounced the R's much more frequently than the other two department stores makes sense because pronunciation of R's or rhoticism was starting to become associated with high status and upper class. What was surprising was that it wasn't the middle middle class department store that had the next highest level or frequency rate of pronunciation of R's, but the lower middle class department store. And what he theorized was that potentially the workers at this lower middle class department store were actually overcompensating. In other words, they recognized in the speech patterns of other people in the city that R's were considered high status, and they actually started to pronounce R's in places didn't exist. This was indicative of an entire group of people emulating an accent pattern that they associated with high prestige or high status. So what about your experience? Have you ever found yourself pronouncing things differently based on the people you're speaking with or based on the context? Tell me about it in the comments below. I'll see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe.